Hello there, in today's video I'm going to be talking about DJI OcuSync and I'm going to hopefully try and give you guys some information on A, how the system works, B, what the differences are between the versions of it on different aircraft and why DJI have been able to upgrade it and use it with existing hardware. Quickly, before we get started, I would just like to say if you like what you see in this video, please do subscribe to the channel. There is a link in the bottom right hand corner of this video and by clicking this you will receive updates on anything that we do in the future. Finally, there are some links in the description of this video to the products that you have seen. By using these links you do support the channel and it does help us to purchase new products to talk to you about in the future. So what is OcuSync? Well it was first introduced with the Mavic Pro and is part of the Lightbridge family. It's a wireless transmission system that offers low latency HD wireless video signal and control signal and allows you to transmit this up to long range. Now the original Mavic Pro was able to transmit HD 720p up to 7 kilometers in total. Transmitting on 2.4 GHz, OcuSync could transmit both 720p and 1080p video. Now in 1080p mode it would only really give you short range and when you selected that in auto it would automatically drop down to 720p once the signal started to degrade. One of the big benefits of OcuSync was its fairly low latency for a digital system. Whilst nowhere near as low as analog it was between 160 and 170 milliseconds and one of the big benefits of it was that it allowed you to have up to four devices connected in total and DJI allow you to use either two remote controllers and two goggles or three remotes and one set of goggles and this was something new that we hadn't heard of at the time. Shortly after the Mavic Pro, DJI released their new goggles. These were able to receive the OcuSync signal directly and they offered low latency wireless FPV. Now they supported a number of aircraft features that included head tracking, camera control and aircraft settings and they also introduced a new smooth mode which gave 720p 60 frames a second live viewing. The advantage to this mode is that it had a lower latency than the normal channel modes and it was able to give you FPV it down to 110 milliseconds. One of the downsides to this mode though was that it limited recording on the aircraft to 1080p 60 frames a second as well. So you could record at 4k if you used the standard transmission modes with the higher latency but if you wanted to get the best possible latency and the lowest latency out of the Mavic Pro whilst using the goggles you had to use this new smooth mode. Later DJI updated the Mavic to the Mavic Pro Platinum, however there was no changes to the OcuSync Air system on this model, it was exactly the same system which still worked with the DJI goggles as it did before and there was no changes whatsoever. Shortly after the Mavic Pro Platinum, DJI released the Goggles Racing Edition alongside the OcuSync Air system. This was designed for DIY use in FPV race drones as well as fixed wing aircraft and it was a new updated version of the OcuSync system, sort of label it OcuSync 1.5. It now added dual band so it would work on both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. It had lower latency than the original OcuSync on the Mavic Pro and it was specifically designed for FPV flying. It had a maximum resolution of 1280 by 960 with a latency as low as 50 milliseconds if you drop the resolution down to 480p. Another new feature with this system was it had the ability to automatically switch between bands, so change between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz in flight to get the best possible signal. The next aircraft to use OcuSync was the new Phantom 4 Pro version 2.0. The original Phantom 4 Pro still used Lightbridge but the 4 Pro version 2.0 they shifted to the newer OcuSync. Now again this was more of a hybrid system, it wasn't the same as the Mavic Pro but it also wasn't quite the same as the goggles either. It had the same dual band as the goggles OcuSync Air system but it was not able to change band automatically in flight so whilst it could use 2.4 or 5 gigahertz you had to manually select it. It was still able to transmit up to 1080p and it had a range of approximately 7 kilometers. It did have a latency of between 160 and 220 milliseconds and the reason for that being so wide was it depended if you were using a smartphone or you were using the Plus RC 
from DJI. The lowest latency came when you were using the Plus RC, which was between 160 and 180 milliseconds, and the 220 milliseconds figure was if you were using an Android device, basically. Like the original OcuSync, it still had the option for 1080p, and it would still drop down to 720p when the signal became weak. Next, this week, we had the new Mavic 2, and this uses something called OcuSync 2.0. And what DJI have done here is pretty much combined all of the previous versions of OcuSync into one system and added some improvements as well. The new system will give up to 1080p in 8 kilometers. It has dual band 2.4 and 5 gigahertz with automatic band switching in flight. So it will automatically jump between the two to give you the best possible signal. Signal. It has a new lower latency than we have seen on any of the RTF craft before with 120 to 130 milliseconds and it has the ability to separate the control and video link frequency onto different bands and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Another advantage to OcuSync overall is that it is firmware updatable and I'll talk about this more shortly. Looking at OcuSync in a lot more detail, it is basically an identical system to DJI Lightbridge in the sense that it is an OFDM video carrier which is surrounded by FHSS control signals. Now, if you look at the top picture, you have an OFDM carrier in the centre. This is that very large mass of lots of little carriers you can see in the middle. And the way the OFDM works on these aircraft is when you first turn it on, it will look for a clear channel and the video will settle on that channel and stay there throughout the flight. The only time that video carrier will shift is A if it picks up interference or B if you manually tell it to change channel. However, as long as it's working in normal environment, it will pick a single channel on startup and that's where it will stay for the entire flight until you turn the aircraft off. Around this, you would then have an FHSS control signal. Now, the way FHSS works is you have constant packets of data jumping across the entire band. The bottom picture is a spectrum representation of this, and the blue peaks are basically the historic positions of where the carrier has been. It is jumping at such a high frequency, it is often very difficult to see. So what each of these peaks is, is a position where the carrier has jumped to, and it is constantly jumping between these positions. Now, it's not doing it in order. It often does it randomly. So what you will have is it jumping from the first one to the eighth, to the third, to the tenth, and so forth. And when you look at it on a spectrum, what you end up seeing is this representation of lots and lots of peaks. Each of those peaks is a position where the carrier has been and it will jump back to at some point in the future, but it is not in that position when you show it like this. The way both OcuSync and Lightbridge are, it is these two systems combined into one. If we look at an actual OcuSync trace, you can still see the OFDM mass in the center, and this is the main video carrier that is carrying your HD video signal from your aircraft back to your remote controller. Then the blue peaks you can see all around it are the FHSS signals jumping around for your control link. The light blue one here is one of the current ones that it's been jumped onto, and the darker blue are the historic ones where it's been in the past. Some Something to note when you look at this is you can also see that it jumps over the OFDM carrier as well. So the FHSS is constantly switching frequency at a high rate and it even jumps over the main channel that your video is on. Because it is jumping so fast, it doesn't matter that it jumps over the top because even if that information isn't received, it's already jumped onto the next position and that packet will be picked up by your remote controller or your aircraft. Comparing OcuSync to Lightbridge on a spectrum, the top one is OcuSync and the bottom one is a Lightbridge signal. And as you can see, they are very, very similar. You still have the same OFDM masses with the FHSS control signal jumping around it. So as I said, on the top one, the big red mass is your OFDM with your light blues and dark blues being the FHSS. And on the Lightbridge at the bottom, it's again the same. The red mass is the OFDM with the blues with the FHSS as bin and the pink ones the current position it's jumping onto so when you look at these two systems from a radio point of view they are very very similar and virtually identical 
So what is the actual difference between them? Well, the basics are as follows. Lightbridge is a combination of custom hardware and software. It's expensive to build because it was originally based on FPGAs. However, with later and Lightbridge 2, DJI moved over to using custom silicon. However, because it is a combination of hardware and software, it is expensive to make and it also has limited upgradability. And this is why when you look at things like the original Phantom 3 and the Inspire one which were compatible with each other when you then move to the Inspire 2 they were not compatible and that was because there was hardware differences and you couldn't use one with the other. OcuSync on the other hand is more of a software based system and more of an SDR. It's able to work on generic off the shelf hardware so existing Wi-Fi hardware for instance is able to use the OcuSync system and it allows DJI to keep the hardware costs down because they're not having to make custom hardware or expensive FPGAs and they allows them to use a far more compact packaging because many of the SOCs and the processors we use in all devices these days like in smart smartphones and in these drones already have radio hardware on board that is designed for Wi-Fi. So DJI are able to leverage existing hardware to be able to get the same type of system that they originally designed with Lightbridge. If we look at the benefits of OcuSync over Lightbridge, well, because OcuSync is a software-based system, it means DJI can upgrade it. Now, there will always be hardware limitations. So if we look at the original DJI goggles, they will be updating that to support the new OcuSync 2.0 that came with the Mavic 2. It will only work on 2.4 gigahertz because there isn't a 5 gigahertz radio. However, if this was Lightbridge, they wouldn't have even been able to do that because Lightbridge is a common combination of hardware and software for the whole transmission system it just wouldn't have been compatible however because OcuSync is an SDR and it is software it means within reason and as long as the processors are powerful enough to support it they can upgrade existing systems to be compatible with the newer ones the basics are between the two they are very very similar systems OcuSync allows DJI to do what they did with Lightbridge on basically existing off-the-shelf hardware. It allows them to do it better and cheaper in smaller packaging and that's why the Lightbridge system has been sort of kept for the larger and more expensive aircraft whereas OcuSync has been used on the lower models but it's giving virtually identical performance. If I'm honest I think DJI will pretty much move over to OcuSync on every system as time moves on whilst the Inspire 2 currently does still use Lightbridge because there are a few little benefits of using Lightbridge I would expect any future aircraft to probably move over to using OcuSync compared to using Lightbridge. Okay, finally, before I finish up this video, I put together two charts which shows what aircraft is compatible with what accessory. So if we start at the top, you've got the DJI Mavic Pro. It works only on the 2.4 gigahertz band and it uses the original OcuSync system. It will work with the DJI Goggles White Edition, the Goggles Race Edition, as well as the original Mavic Remote. Next, you can see the OcuSync A system, and that works on the dual band, which is 2.4 gig and 5 gigahertz, and is compatible with the same three items as well. If we look at the P4 Pro version 2.0, this again is dual band OcuSync. However, as of today, it only works with the white edition goggles and the goggles RE. And then finally at the bottom you have the new Mavic 2. Again dual band but it does use this new OcuSync 2.0 and it will be compatible with the white edition goggles, the race edition goggles and the original Mavic remote all after a firmware update. In this chart I've got the goggles or the device on the left with the systems it works with on the right showing you what band it will work on. So if we look at the top, the goggles white edition, they only work on 2.4 gigahertz. So they will work with the Mavic 2, the Mavic Pro and the A system but they will only work on that 2.4 gigahertz band. Whereas if we look at the goggles RE, they will work with all of the three devices the Mavic 2 the Mavic Pro and the Air system and it will work on 2.4 
and 5 gigahertz. So if the aircraft or the air system supports 5 gigahertz, it will work with it. The third is the original Mavic RC. Again, only 2.4 gig, and it works with all three aircraft apart from the Mavic 2 until it has a firmware update. And the bottom one is the new Mavic 2 remote. Currently, we only know it works with the Mavic 2. In theory, there may be compatibility with other devices, but we won't know that until the future. Finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit of why the Mavic Air uses Wi-Fi and the Mavic Pro uses OcuSync. Whilst I've mentioned OcuSync uses off-the-shelf hardware, it does still need a lot of processing. That processing creates heat and you have to have the space to add that processing and get rid of that heat when it's in use. And the basics are, whilst you can still package OcuSync in an aircraft the size of the Mavic Pro, getting that into a system like the Mavic Air is probably a bit too much of an ask. If anyone has got the OcuSync Air system, you will know how much heat that system produces and that heat has to go somewhere. And basically with an aircraft the size of the Mavic Air, they pretty much hit the limitation of what they could squeeze into a package of that size. That is it for this video. I hope I've been able to explain it a little bit in detail for you guys. If you've liked what you've seen, please do subscribe to the channel. There is a button down there in the corner. You can also support the channel by purchasing via links in the description for this video. Thank you for watching and I will do another one again soon.